Excellent. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, episode number 11. Um, and yeah, I've been doing this for a while now. It's it's my monthly Q&A video where I answer questions that you guys ask. So all the questions from this month are being derived from last month's Probing Paul, episode number 10. And look look how far back through time we can look through this portal. That, it, the original one is getting so tiny now, it's, it's almost difficult to even see. Let's get into it with question number one, though, from StrikerX1360. Hey, Paul, I've got an i5-4690K on Z97 with DDR3. I'm bottlenecking the hell out of my 1080. I uh, was wondering if saving for an i7-7700K would be wise. Uh, he does video editing. I believe the increased performance of the i5 variant would benefit me, uh, which is a good question, but um, I will say... Look, look at the 4690K. Now this is Devil's Canyon. This was Haswell Refresh. Still selling for 240 bucks on Newegg. Not a very good deal when you compare it to, um, say, you know, a 6600K or a 7600K that's available now. But obviously it still has some chops. This isn't too outdated of a processor. Now in the rest of your posts, because there was a little bit of a thread going on below, we also found out that he's running uh, 3540, 3440 by 1440, so ultra wide with the high resolution. Uh, and that also he's not overclocking, although he does have a liquid cooling system in place. Now my suggestion here would definitely be to overclock. This is only going to turbo boost to 3.9 gigahertz and uh, you should at least be able to get 4.4 to 4.5 especially if you're using liquid cooling and that should help your performance. However, he also stated that the games he was having difficulty with was CSGO and Minecraft, which really aren't that difficult to run. They can be a little bit more CPU dependent than GPU dependent, but my suggestion would be maybe to look at other possible contributing factors because this CPU should be able to help. Um, if you overclock it in particular, it should be able to keep up with that 1080, and I would wait definitely to like really upgrade at least until Zen and Ryzen CPUs come out next month or in the next month or two. There should be some price updates, hopefully, that happen after that drop, so that should at least give you a bit better selection if you are considering upgrading. But yeah, overclock and maybe check out your software situation, see if you have processes running in the background, look at your memory, see if that's somehow getting chewed up somehow and that's contributing to the lower frame rates. Because if you're running at a higher resolution, like 3440 by 1440, um, at least in games that are more GPU dependent, the CPU should not be the bottleneck. If you're running at really low resolutions and the GPU is churning out a bunch of frames, that's when the CPU can start to get bogged down a little bit. So uh, thank you for the question. And let's jump to question number two, which is right here. Murky Conduct, which is, I like your name, uh, says, hey, Paul, I have a laptop that has Windows 10 on it. Is it possible to transfer it to a PC build? Uh, I was originally just gonna say, no, it's not. Joel Reynolds also here replied and said, yes, if it's an OEM, and he says he had to contact Microsoft and really push them because he got a replacement key with a pro key and he was able to talk them into it. But let me just state this for the record. Uh, my contacting Microsoft can be very hit or miss, in particular, if you're using an OEM key and laptops have OEM keys. That's generally speaking, how they work. But let me give a, a bit of more of an explanation of kind of how Windows did things with Windows 10 is that if you buy Windows 10 directly from Microsoft and you get a key and then you punch it into your newly installed computer, the key is actually used, it's, it's burnt or whatever, and then uh, you get a digital entitlement that ties itself to your hardware. In, from what I understand, the motherboard and actually uh, can do some a specific writing into the UEFI there. The cool thing about this is if you activate Windows on like an old system or like a system with the motherboard and then take that motherboard and put it like, you know, reconfigure the system or something and do a fresh install of Windows on it, Windows should just activate. The Windows database should recognize uh, the digital entitlement tied to that hardware and just activate the software. That's happened to me two or three uh, times so far. With your particular situation, you have a laptop, so that's got an OEM key, um, and chances are you're not going to be able to change that or move that around at all. Windows is much more restricted when it comes to giving people service. When it comes to OEM keys, they say, they say talk to the, the manufacturer of your device instead. Ever since Windows did the anniversary update, I don't know when that was, a few months back, um, you can actually take your Microsoft account with your Windows 10 digital license, and you can tie your Windows 10 digital license to the Microsoft account. This would actually allow you to have, for example, like multiple computers with a unique login for your Microsoft account so you can move between different machines. 
Uh, there are some restrictions in place. I don't want to dive too much into the details right here, but um, I will say I prefer not having the Microsoft account. I prefer just a unique you know, user login just to the machine. But if you really have a Windows license, especially if you bought it retail and you need the ability to switch between multiple machines, uh, consider tying it to your Microsoft account and that might make activation, uh, especially if you do a hardware update, a little bit easier. But to give a too long didn't read answer, um, no, you probably cannot take your OEM key from a laptop and move it to a desktop unless you're in a very interesting situation, uh, much like Joel was here and, and you managed to talk Microsoft into it. But that's seriously up to them and, and I've, I rarely ever hear that actually happening. Here's a question from Zuga. Why did you leave Newegg? What made you have your own channel? This is a question I've actually sort of addressed before in Probing Paul, but I bring it back up very specifically because, all right, I feel kind of bad about this just a little bit, but I, 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 wanted, I wanted to do it, so I'm, I'm just gonna do it anyway, even though I feel kind of bad. All right, so I left Newegg for a variety of reasons. One of the big reasons was that I tried to work with management to sort of coordinate things, because when you're doing a creative job, like creating videos, even if you're just talking about PC hardware, that kind of thing, um, you need to kind of, you need to keep a little bit of a fire going. And if you feel like um, your voice isn't being heard when you're saying, I think we should do things this way or whatever, um, it just tends to sort of suck that out of you. So that over time, plus sort of what I, from my perspective, was not mean, my voice not being heard by the people who are actually running things and making decisions, led me to decide, you know what, I think I'm just gonna kinda go it on my own. And when I left Newegg, I was about like 80 to 85,000 subscribers. And the stupid thing is that the people who I had disagreements with, they aren't even there anymore. Like they, so they went in and did whatever they did and, and now they're not there anymore. But um, I did wanna point this out. First off, Newegg has a new crew that's working there. I actually met them at CES and they were very nice people. So if you guys do wanna check their stuff out, I think they have improved it in, in the past few months. Um, things seem to be turning around. They seem to be more hardware, fo hardware focused and that kind of thing. But again, uh, my bit of schadenfreude here, to use a word that uh, my old Newegg coworker, Rachel, really liked to use, is that I have finally passed them in subscribers. Um, I'm at 456 now. And I, I didn't really like tweet about that or anything, but um, it took uh, two years and two years and four months or so. This is my announcement video that I had uh, uh, separated from Newegg, which was September 21st, 2014. So two, two years and three or four months, um, and, and I've come so far. So I'm happy with the decision. And again, I bear no ill will towards Newegg. Of course, there were some pe people who aren't there anymore who I wasn't super happy with, but um, we'll leave it at that. And hopefully that gives you guys a bit more of an explanation of what went down there. Anyway, uh, next question is from McLaren's Car of the Week reviews right here. I'm currently using a Hophog. HD PVR60, that's as close as I can get to pronouncing this, Hophog. It is a Native American word, uh, Native American Indian to be specific. Uh, HD PVR60, I would like to step up to something with a higher bit rate. I have built a PC to handle it, aside from Elgato and Evermedia uh, options with 60K bit rates, which would include like the uh, Elgato HD60. Um, what would you recommend for video capture, assuming no limit in file size? Um, I almost kind of felt bad bringing this question up and answering it because I don't really have a very good answer to it, to be perfectly honest. I have a bit of research I've done. I'll point you towards a couple brands. The first brand is Magewell, and um, they, they're they more sort of towards the prosumer getting into the uh, much more expensive professional market, so the capture cards tend to cost a lot. But although I have not worked with them directly, I have heard very positive things about them uh, recently, although their website needs to, they need to change their website a little bit because they obviously have a code issue throwing there at the top. Anyway, uh, but yeah, Magewell parts can be expensive, uh, you know, starting around 300 bucks going up to the, you know, 500 to $1,000 range. But again, I've heard good things about them. Beyond that, um, I would check out Blackmagic. Again, people are, have hit and miss stuff with them. My most recent capture card purchase is this uh, Blackmagic Decklink Mini Recorder 4K internal PCIe card. And I did some testing, initial stuff with it about a month and a half ago, and I haven't touched it since, purely for lack of time. So again, I wish I had a better answer for you for that. But um, uh, yeah, at least Blackmagic and, and Majel, well, I would say check those out. Next is uh, Amoti... Am Amitoj Singh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your, your name wrong. Uh, dual 16x9 or single 21x9 with the 16x9 on top. Uh, definitely single 21x9 with the 16x9 on top. If you're gonna game, you're probably gonna game on one screen. 
having a 21 by 9 screen I think is a very ideal gaming situation uh, and yeah I mean you're you're basically giving yourself more screen real estate by 21 by 9 and a better gaming experience and you can put that 16 by 9 up on top or you could flip it uh, vertical and put it off to the side which is a great way to uh, look at web pages and that kind of thing as well Jonathan Heiner asks a very good question well he actually corrected me first from last uh, month's video gigabyte not gigabit which was definitely my mistake when you're talking about bits versus bytes and how they are calculated and how they are actually shown when you're advertised products there is confusion there uh, but anyway, more to his point, thanks for the SSD discussion. I'm still weighing options for a future upgrade, and I'm slowly becoming less interested in M.2 NVMe as the prices are simply too high per gigabyte. I feel most consumers don't need the added performance. My thoughts. I would completely agree with you, Jonathan, um, largely because those N NVMe M.2 drives are still so freaking expensive. It's cool to look at like a little chewing gum stick, you know, roughly sized... SSD and and think like wow that by itself has the same performance as like a two or three or four or even like six drive RAID array with standard SSD like standard SATA SSDs some impressive performance but if you're not going to use it it's definitely not worth it you really need to have something that you do with that SSD to make it like worth the money that you invest in it so. I, my excuse is video editing, because that's something where you need a ton of storage readily available that it can quickly pull off of your permanent storage and drop into the memory or whatever. Now there are some SSDs that are NVMe and M.2 that are coming down in price a bit. Uh, the SSD 600P series from Intel is definitely one of those. However, this one has a pretty significantly reduced performance when you compare it to the, the much faster ones. So like the sequential writes here are 560 megabits, megabytes per second. Uh, reads are, are pretty fast, 1775, but again, not quite up there with like the Samsung 960s and that kind of thing. Um, however, I mean, you can still get this and it will be faster than a typical SATA drive. But yeah, for your money, getting a few SATA drives and rating them together could be an option, although then you deal with the possibility of drive failure. Um, but yeah, for now, we got to kind of keep watching those NVMe drives. They're still kind of a premium product and they cost a lot of money, but hopefully the pricing will come down soon. Federico Trenton, what do you think about used hardware? What components are fine even when pre-owned and what to avoid buying used? And I believe this is the last question. Yes, it is. All right. Uh, so that is, that is a good question. I might do a separate video on this as well, but let me run down the parts first off and I'll say what I think is good and what is not. All right, first off, CPU. Uh, CPUs are a good, good part to buy used as long as they're confirmed to work because CPUs very rarely fail and they typically don't suffer from performance degradation. If you can ask if the CPU you're buying used has been overclocked, and particularly if it's been running at a high voltage for a while, that would be the one caveat where I would say don't buy it if it's been like overclocked for the past three years running at 1.5 volts or something like that. Uh, CPU cooler, yeah, you can you can buy those used. I think uh, just make sure you know they're they're cleaned off and everything. Uh, that doesn't apply to uh, liquid coolers though. I wouldn't do that. Uh, the pump will fail eventually. Motherboards next. Uh, that's hit or miss. Uh, you can have individual parts of a motherboard that fail, so that would be a, a warning sign. Like if you buy a used motherboard and then you set it up and it works and like oh everything's fine, then you go to connect your network and like the NIC is dead or something like that. That would suck. So uh, I've kind of 50/50 on buying used motherboards. Uh, memory is usually okay, again, as long as it's confirmed to work. Memory does go bad eventually over time, but uh, typically if it's working, it's working and will last for a very long uh, period of time. Storage, I would say no. Uh, hard drives and SSDs, you typically don't know how much they've been used, and again, they will die eventually, so um, unless you can get like a, a snapshot of the smart readout uh, from the drive so you can know exactly like how many, how many bytes have been written to it and that kind of thing, Typically, I would not recommend buying storage secondhand. A graphics card, I would say, is probably okay. Again, as long as it's cleaned and not like completely caked with dust and that kind of thing. Uh, case is probably okay. Again, as long as it's been cleaned out. Cases have a very long lifespan. Power supply as well. Um, as long as it's a decent power supply, if it's 80 plus rated and it's from a reputable manufacturer, they should have a very long lifespan. And again, as long as it's cleaned and not caked with dust and hasn't been used by a smoker or that kind of thing. And I think that's just about all the parts beyond that. Uh, I guess monitors, monitors again are hit, are hit or miss. If they're very old, the backlight can start to go out on them and get dimmer and the colors cannot be as vibrant. So again, I'm kind of 50-50 on that. And then peripherals like keyboards and mice, uh, I would say probably not because they tend to get a lot of use and get gunky and, and worn out and stuff. Um, so that's a nice thing to get new and plus, you know, 
you you interact with them, so there's a lot more uh, debris and detritus that might uh, kind of get get up in there. So uh, yeah, peripherals, I'd say you know buy those new if you have the option. And that's gonna do it for this month's episode of Probing Paul, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, leave me thumbs ups if you did, uh, because I love your feedback. And every time people hit thumbs up, it makes me smile and I get a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Uh, also, of course, if you have questions for me for next month, leave them in the comment section down below. I will be browsing through those uh, probably today. And then also probably again when I uh, set up for next month's Probing Paul. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time.